This episode of the Will Talk podcast is sponsored by Factor, America's number one ready to eat meal kit. During the prime spring season, you need wholesome, convenient meals to energize you for warmer and more active days. And this keeps you on track for reaching your goals. Factor, America's number one ready to eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with ready to eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and tackle everything on your to-do list. So head over to factormeals.com slash willtalk40 and use code willtalk40 to get 40% off your first box. That's code willtalk40 at factormeals.com slash willtalk40 to get 40% off your first box. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Women in Leadership Talk podcast. Super excited today. We have Joanna Bloor joining us. Joanna, thanks for coming all the way from California to have a conversation with us today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to have this chat. Oh, so are we. So are we. We're thrilled. We can't wait to get into this. And so much, so much to talk about. Um, like Joanna, just for our audience, Joanna just launched a book. So we're super excited to talk about that and all the great stories she has for us. But before we jump into all that, I just want to share thank you so much to our audience for being here today. We know you have a choice as to what podcast you listen to. We all have busy schedules. So we'd like to keep this nice and tight and give you those nuggets that you can walk away with and, and really use in your life as soon as you as soon as you listen to the podcast. So thank you very much for being here today. So let me give you a little background about Joanna. So Joanna is a career futurist. She's a multi-time TED speaker and an author of Tales of Potential, the Cinderella story you haven't heard yet. So, so excited to jump into this. And this just launched on Amazon. So we're going we're gonna to get into some stories about that. In her professional life, Joanna climbed the executive ranks of companies that created futures that didn't exist. From early Web 1.0 with Ticketmaster and Cars.com to Web 2.0 with Pandora. Before having her own epiphany, which her true passion wasn't the future promise of technologies created by people, it was in the future potential of the people who created those technologies. And so she is the founder of Amplify Lab and has helped thousands of individuals and organizations from PayPal to Google to GE tap into a people economy that trades on potential. I love that because you and I come from the same from the same, you know, philosophy, it is all about the people. If you take care of the people, the people take care of your business. So Joanna, welcome. Super excited, as I said, to have you here. And let's jump in and get, you know, start talking and, and get you to share a little bit about your background and, and, you know, what's led you here to where you are today. Awesome. Um, so like, how did, I, so how on earth, is that the question? Are we starting right there? Or yeah. Did we, Okay. Just share some of your background like, and what got I'm us here. Sure yeah. So I come back to this. Um, I built my entire career basically working with products and systems that people didn't understand. I had, I had a lot of career breaks, but I will say I had kind of that uh, springboard moment in my mid twenties. Um, at the time, I was working high end retail, and one of my models behind the scenes at a fashion show turned to me and she said, oh, Joanna, you're kind of a nerd and you're really good at sales. And there's this company that's looking for people who are a little bit technical and, and really understand sales. Like it's this new internet thing. And just to, just to anchor kind of timing, this was when um, it would have probably taken three or four days to download a movie off of Netflix. Have we still been on the same systems we were then? It was really, really early internet days. And so I was like, well, this is intriguing. And while I loved my job at the time, I, I took the opportunity to have a conversation with the company who was hiring and found myself at one of the very first uh, startups in the mid nineties. And because there was no rule book, guidebook, how to anything um, in any way, shape or form in the workplace, the the constant conversation with there with my management team and with the executive team is anytime we came up across something new, 
the statement was, well, why don't you go take a stab at that? Because nobody had any answers to anything. And what it meant was I kept on going, absolutely, this is super fun. I love taking a stab at that. And I got really comfortable with living on what I call the skinny branches of uh, innovation. And most importantly, getting really good at understanding how to explain a thing that people did not understand. Because I was either explaining a product or I was explaining a process, or I was explaining a job. Um, literally, I was like every day, oh, I'm gonna make up a new rule book for all of this. And um, and got known for that professionally, which mm -hmm. meant I then got recruited to work in all sorts of amazing companies um, where they'd be like, yeah, so we need to build a future that we cannot see. And I'd be like, bring it on, this is what I wanna do. Um, and then I had, and I had lots of springboard moments along there, but then I had a moment back in, gosh, it would have been 2014, um, where I had just, I wasn't finished with a project, but I was in a company where um, what I had originally come in to do, my initial like, oh, hang on, this is the mountain we need to climb here. I had climbed the mountain there and had done really well, like just to kind of give I'm going to do some lady bragging for just a second. Please. <laughs> company, yeah, I was, as you, you should all learn how to do this, by the way. But the company I was working for had basically gone from a hundred million to about a billion dollars. Wow. With me as part of the, the team helping bring that. And I say that me, me and the team and all the people, this was ambitions are never manifested alone. Um, but I knew that I had made a strategic decision for the company that was an accelerant for about 800 million of that billion dollars. So I was feeling pretty confident with myself. <laughs> However, I got that, oh God, I still, it's been years and I'm still slightly traumatized, but I got that really painful conversation where they said, we don't think you're the person to lead this part of the organization into the future. And I was absolutely devastated because I had poured my heart and soul into this. And, um, and after I picked my, you know, I, you know, lay down on the floor and had a little cry as one does. And I picked myself up and I said, well, hang on a second. Um, step back and look at this for a second. Did you accomplish what it is you came here to accomplish? Do you see a future for yourself within this organization? And what accountability can you take for yourself on this? Like, wh like what actually happened here? Because you should not have been surprised. And what I realized was two things. One, um, in that role, I had actually accomplished what I'd wanted to accomplish and I couldn't see the future. So actually I was the wrong person because in a leadership role, you better be able to have an opinion, an idea and what have you about the future. And I realized I had committed the fatal career error of forgetting that people tell tales of potential about you. You know, I am known for, and I now talk about this idea of every decision made about you and your opportunities is made in a room that you're not in. Yeah. And if you have an ambition, whatever it is, you better know what that conversation is and or help people teach it. And I had 1000% at the beginning of that opportunity been very clear about this is the future value I can bring to this organization. Here is who you are in essence buying if you bring me and my time and my brain into this organization. And, you know, I'd done all of the things and then I'd forgotten that I needed to, to continue teaching people. And so they were, they didn't dislike me by any stretch of the imagination, but they just couldn't see the future narrative. And so they stopped buying mm -hmm. and they were like, well, we still want you to stay in the company. And I was like, I can't stay. And so I ended up leaving and was so obsessed about this idea that I just started talking to everybody about it. And, you know, long story short, have now built an entire career around this idea of the silent conversation, the idea of absolutely every relationship, and I mean every relationship, is based on not just your qualifications and your certifications and your experiences, but so much more about this tale of potential that you are telling about people. And what I realized is that my experience in being able to explain products that people didn't understand applied fantastically to what I think is the coolest product on the planet, which is other people's time. And so I now run around 
the world, basically, talking about how do you buy and sell time in an organization? Because that is that is what we are doing when we are collaborating. And whether there's a financial transaction is a whole different story, but how do you buy and sell time? And I am specifically known for, when I speak publicly, literally plucking people out of the audience and transforming live in front of everybody how somebody talks about themselves. Because initially, most people, when they say, oh, what do you do? They'll say, oh, I'm a X title at X company, because that's what we've all been taught to do. And I'm like, really? Really? That's super boring, because it tells me nothing about who you are and what you're all about. And so I then come in and transform your tale of potential. And the audience goes, oh, oh my God, that's amazing. How do you do it? I'm like, because I've been doing it for 25 years. <laughs> but when I when I was thinking about this, I was like, I can continue to do this one person at a time, mm -hmm. or I can write a book about it and really sit here and say, look, this tale of potential thing is a thing, however much you might go, oh, but I don't want to, like, I don't like that. And it makes me feel uncomfortable. And so I wrote it. And then as I was sitting here going, like, how do I tell this story? Um, I was like, you know what? I'm going to get the most universal story of a person out there, um, which is the one of Cinderella. Little, uh, mm -hmm. we can all relate to. <laughs> like 500 different versions of the Cinderella story. Yes. <laughs> and what I loved about it is, uh, most of us, if I sat here and said, would you hire Cinderella to join your team? Um, most people are a little bit hesitant because her tale of potential is not awesome. And so I retell her tale in a way where basically everybody who has read the book is all like, oh my God, she's amazing. Not only is she amazing, but the prince is pretty fabulous too. And wow, I need to rethink the stepmother because maybe I had her tale of potential wrong. Like, there is no character who doesn't get a look at on this. And I was like, it's the start of this conversation because I come back to what you just said. Like when you understand how to tell your tale of potential and let people go, oh, I totally want that. Um, people start asking to collaborate with you because they want you much more than if they like you. Mm. Love that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I say this because I know you, I mean, I know you have lots of different people who listen to this, but this is a, this is a show for women by women, which is amazing. Love it. Um, but I really sit here and I say, you know, I've worked with uh, people across all sorts of countries and all genders and all skin colors. And what I see over and over and over again is we are taught to optimize for liked and especially yeah. as women. Um, whereas men are taught more to optimize for wanted. And it is such a subtle difference and it makes such a spectacular difference. And so for individuals, I sit here and I go like, how do you shift your own tail of potential to optimize for wanted so that other people can choose you? And then if they, and when they do, you're like, great, you're choosing me for exactly who I am and what I'm all about. Yeah. Or they are not, and it is not a character flaw on your part. And you know, when you say, uh, you were saying at the beginning about how it's actually people who have all of the things and all of the magic, like when you are in that place of actually saying like, do you want the future me? Mm -hmm. um, do you want to choose my potential? There's a sense of confidence and empowerment and agency that is transformational. And it just, it makes for a better workplace all the way around because people want people for who they, who they are rather than yes. some nonsense story. Exactly. So, like, long story to how I got here, <laughs> but you know, like anything, there's always a lot of uh, detail in the background. Oh, of course. Well, and that's what I wanted to hear, right? Like how you how you move from one to the other, because that story, first of all, it helps us all to relate, right? And and I what I loved was like when you were even talking about your story about how they would give you a product or something, and then you were the one trying to figure out what what are the rules or what are the procedures or processes. What, what I hear from you is you're not afraid of uncertainty. You're not afraid of the unknown. It's like, yeah, just put me right in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go for this. I want to see what I can discover. Um, so that curiosity is really heightened. And so I'm not surprised you wrote a book that's, you know, the tells of potential, the Cinderella story. I, I think that's terrific. And, and you've already sort of alluded to a little bit of what we can expect, but let's, let's talk about that a, a bit, you know, tell us more about you know, the book, number one, and the reason that 
you felt so passionate about writing it because mm. you could have picked a thousand topics um, or a thousand different ways to express it. So let's just get into that a little bit. Sure. You to uh, so I am going to confess to people um, because anybody who's like, oh my God, I need to write a book. Uh, this is the fourth version of how to get Joanna's brain onto paper. The fourth. <laughs> okay. I had so many false starts because of what I call the itty bitty shitty committee, which is that mm. little voice. Like that's your own tale of potential in your sure. head. Sure. Um, <laughs> very real though. It's very and, real. <laughs> and I will also say, you know, uh, probably one of the most common things I hear when people are like, well, hang on a second. How do I, like, how do you do this? And what do you do? And all of this is, a lot, you know, I get often the, oh, well, do you work with men? And, yeah. and I go, does a man need to sell his time? Because if he needs to sell his time, then yes. Um, you know, does a man need to be good at helping other people choose them a hundred percent? And and I get a little cross sometimes. Um, and I knew, uh, that if I wrote a book about Cinderella, it would actually anchor me more into the, this is a woman only book. And I thought, uh, I had a very, uh, angsty conversation about it, but I actually sat there and I said, you know, one of the things that I really try to like my job in life when I talk about selling somebody's future time mm. and how to make it easy for people to choose it is my job is to bring you right up to the line of ambition and self-promotion and I the line of authenticity and once you cross over that line then you sound like kind of a jerk before yeah. that line <laughs> is right where you need to be because if you are underselling your ambitions and your value and all of this sort of stuff, well, then you're actually not offering the most fabulous version of you. And so I said, drink your own Kool-Aid, Joanna. The most fabulous version of you is a combination of like Bette Midler meets Steve Nozniak with like a side of Tony Robbins on it. So you need to be as slightly ridiculous as you are. You need to own the fact that you wear sequins a ton, which is super fun. Um, that you are like, if, if I could have been Bette Midler's child, I would have been a very happy person. I think she's amazing. Like mm -hmm. let that Great. all shine through. And the people who were like, eh, well, that's just icky. Not so much. The people who are like, what are you talking about? She talks about Cinderella and she calls herself a modern fairy godmother. That's fantastic. And, and I say that for the listeners, because, um, we are so constantly taught to fit in a box yeah. that other people say is the box we're supposed to fit in. And I was like, mm, I'm going to fight against it. So when I wrote the book and decided this is what I want to do, I was like, you need to be so you that somebody reading it would feel like they were going on a hike with you, yeah. which is what I did. Like I wrote a book that I was like, okay, I like to read a book that when I leave the Bay area and fly to New York, which happens quite a bit, I can read the book on the plane and I'm done by the time I get to JFK. So it is a light read. Um, is it also a fun read? Like everybody has come back and gone, oh my God, this is super, like I tell jokes and I give real examples and all of those sorts of things. So it's a fun read, but then I'm also hugely practical and action oriented. So while each chapter talks about a different idea in the book, we talk about the fairy tale version and then we flip over to the real world version mm. where I sit here and I say, you know, as, as an example, um, I do not believe the glass slipper was an accident by any stretch of the imagination. We can talk about that in a second. Um, and I sit here and I say like, what's the real world version of somebody using the ideas of the glass slipper for themselves? and because I'm a bit of a dork and I love the technical stuff, we've actually then created a bunch of experiments. Like there's a QR code in the book that somebody goes, oh, I really like this idea. How can I go experiment with it for myself and see if I'm like, oh, yes, actually I agree with this idea. I see it working out for me. We've got a bunch of experiments uh, on the Tales of Potential website where people can actually take these ideas and, and implement them. So really nice. taking the printed page and making it a 360 experience around something that is recognizable and fun, but also hugely actionable at the end of the day, because I knew while everybody was saying, oh my God, you need to write a book about all of this crazy that's in your head. I was like, well, but the writing of the book isn't the point. It's actually the actions of the people at the end of the day that exactly <laughs> ultimately going to make me go, yeah, this has been a fantastic experience. Thank you, Factor, for sponsoring this episode of Will Talk. Listen, if you're too busy to cook this May, 
With Factor, skip the trip to the grocery store, the chopping, the prepping, and the cleanup. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. All you gotta do is just heat and enjoy. And if you're looking for calorie conscious options, try their delicious dietitian approved calorie smart meals with around less than 550 calories per serving. Or if you need that, just that little bit of extra boost of protein, you can try one of their protein plus meals with 30 grams of protein per serving. Factor offers delicious, flavor-packed options every, every week that fit a variety of lifestyle choices. You can choose from keto, calorie smart, vegan, vegetarian, and or protein plus. These meals are prepared by chefs and dietitians approved. Each meal has all of the ingredients you need to feel satisfied all day long. And if you really want to mix it up, you could take one of the vegetarian dishes and add a little bit of protein to your meal choice. They have over 34 chef-approved, chef dietitian-approved weekly options, so there's always something new and exciting to try. And if you like snacks, and who doesn't, round out your meal and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of over 45 add-ons. This includes things for like breakfast meals, so apple cinnamon pancakes, oh my gosh, yummy, love that, bacon and cheese egg bites or potato bacon egg breakfast skillets. Those are just a few options or any wellness boost. So you can try their cold breast juices, their shakes, their smoothie, smoothies, so many different amazing options. And if you're on a budget, Factor is not only cheaper than takeout, their meals are just ready in two minutes. So that's faster than any restaurant. So you have no prep, no mess. 100% of their uh, deliveries emissions are offset to the door and 100% renewable electricity on production sites and offices. So head over to factormeals.com slash willtalk40 and use code willtalk40 to get 40% off your first box. That's code willtalk40 at factormeals.com slash willtalk40. And that gets you 40% off your first box. Oh, I love that. I love that. And and just on that note about the glass slipper. So I know <laughs> one of the things you talk about is how we don't really need a resume, but we do need that glass slipper. So just expand on yeah, that. So yes. Well, let me give you the frame. I'm going to give you a little teaser into the book. Um, so I just gave you a little bit earlier where I said, oh, I don't think the glass slipper is, was an accident. So let's talk about what's happening when Cinderella is coming down the stairs at kind of it's the middle-ish of the book or maybe the, the back third but she's running down the stairs and I sit here and I go what's going on in her head and this the tale of potential I tell about Cinderella in that moment is she could not have been more strategic and thoughtful in her life because here she was with a project deadline which was like always going to go to hell in a handbasket if she didn't get out of there by the time mm. the bells were done ringing. Mm -hmm. So she immediately was like, when the shoe came off, she was like, oh shit, um, I need to get the project finished rather than being perfect. Because if it's perfect, <laughs> I will actually, I will fail. And maybe even the entire project will fail. So actually hitting the deadline is the most important thing, which I just sit here and I go, I would hire somebody who understand that the, the when, was deadline versus perfect important? Oh my God, what an incredibly good skill to have. So she, in a split second, decided that. Then, and this is why I'm just like, she's amazing and I would hire Cinderella tomorrow. She also understood that the prince, who was literally feet behind her, like, I'm sorry, the fact that, well, I actually think that's another bonus point. Like Cinderella can outrun a prince. I'm like, go her. <laughs> um, clearly he was a slow-mo. Um, he had other... <laughs> big things but you see other so, good qualities <laughs> i know he had a he he was actually he showed leadership tendencies too want to find out what they are they're in the book but i sit here and i go she understood the dynamics of the situation and if you unpack the situation for a second like she was booking it right there were still who knows how many quite fabulous other candidates for the job in the ballroom waiting for the prince to come back the party was not over and so she inherently knew she needed to leave something behind so that he would remember her so when he picked up the shoe he'd be like oh my god Cinderella was amazing and I don't need to look at any other candidates 
idea number one. Idea number two, like every hiring manager on the planet, he had to then go back to his, let's say his board of directors, AKA his parents and say, hey, mom and dad, I have found the perfect person. And apparently in fairy tale land, having teeny tiny feet is a benefit, whatever. But he was able to actually show it to his parents and go, here's who I want to actually invest in. And by the way, I need all the resources of the garden, what have you, because I don't know where she is and I have to find her, but I'm thinking this shoe in essence is, is a bit like a business garden. This will help me find her. And so you sit here and go like, the glass slipper was not an accident. The glass slipper was actually the first example of really brilliant swag left for a buyer to find so that they could actually purchase the, pro the product in the future. And yes, I just talked about Cinderella like she was a product. We are all buying and selling time from each other. And once sure. you start to understand that, it's really important. So I sit here. So that's the fairy tale version. How much more impressed are you with Cinderella with her strategic thinking, by the way? No kidding. <laughs> I know. This is just one story. Um, so then you sit here and say, like, what's the real world version of this? And I sit here and I, like, you, do you still need a resume? Sadly, yes, because this is the way the operating system works today. But what I share with people is the resume's job is the same job as the invitation to the party. It's to get you in the consideration set. The resume, and Cinderella's resume was she was single maiden in fairy tale land. That was her resume. I mean, she had all this stuff that she did. That got her an invitation to the ball, that like got her an entry ticket. The resume doesn't do a great job of actually telling your tale of potential. This, the glass slipper did. And so I sit here and I say like, and I think about this in the concept of a sales funnel. So when you think about a sales funnel, like top of sales funnel is, are you in the consideration set? Are you a lead, right? The next step in the sales funnel in the world of buying and buying human time is probably a conversation with the recruiter. Yeah. And right now the, the recruiter has been telling a tale of potential about you based on what they know about the job and what is on your resume, which is why, yes, it's still important. But that conversation with the recruiter is an opportunity to actually tell a richer tale. And I sit here and say, like, we are, I think it's like 300% or something crazy. I need to relook up that data point. More likely to remember a thing when we get a visual version as oh, opposed to text. 100%. Massive. Yeah. So much. This is why in the world of business, logos and colors like tiffany as an example has yes. got a patent on the tiffany blue because yes. it's that important Hermes. yes absolutely exactly. <laughs> and i just sit here and i say okay so if you're sitting in a conversation with a recruiter you can either have this incredibly text-laden document where they are guessing how to tell your story or as an example you can sit here and go you know in this 30 minutes there are three things that I want to make sure I teach this person about who I am and why I am uniquely awesome and how they intersect with each other. So I'm going to tell them how I'm a potentialist, I'm a transformer, and I'm an improviser because they've got all of the, this is what I've done in the past insight. And you sit down and you draw that picture and you say to them, okay, you've seen all of my experience, but here's how I think. I think like a transformer. Um, I communicate like an improviser and I create like a potentialist. And I have stories about all three of those that I can share with you, which one of them intrigues you most, yeah. right? And you actually offer the Venn diagram with the three words in it and you leave it with them like the glass slipper. Because imagine now, I want you all to just put yourself in a hiring manager state. Imagine now you get a call from a recruiter who says, oh my God, I have the most perfect candidate for you. And they hand over not only the resume with all of your past stuff, which is still important, but also this visual, which basically is a teaser of why you are uniquely awesome. Because if you sat if somebody handed you a Venn diagram with the three words on it and said, hey, I want to talk to you to this person because they're a potentialist, a transformer, an improviser, or whatever the three words are, Aren't you going to be like, wait a second, what is all of this? 
and it's going to make you unique and you're going to stand out and, 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 and. And I sit here and I say, like, as you go through the purchase process of a person, um, you should absolutely consider, like, who are the decision makers and what is it you need to teach them and what are their potential objections and how do you think through this instead of this uh, kind of I need to have the perfect answer to the how do you handle your weaknesses conversation are you like what are your biggest weaknesses or like the gotcha questions of the interview process and it's both sides of the equation like it it baffles me that we just use job descriptions and resumes I mean good lord I can't it's be <laughs> there's a better job explaining why it is uniquely awesome like a resume is like a nutrition label the can of beans has yes and I'm like make it easy and this is where you know this is where I think we all get really stuck is like we're we are we are buying our time like we're robots and widgets Mm. and the last time I checked robots and widgets we are not we are way more awesome and way more creative and way more dare I say it, full of potential than a machine. And yeah, so yes. that's oh, why wow. I- Joanna, you said so many things there, like, oh my goodness. Okay, for sure, you got to come back on the show another time with me <laughs> because there's just too much to unpack, you know, through that conversation, that whole potentiality of human beings. And we, we are our own limitation. We stifle ourselves. And so I love the example that you were sharing there about like, you have to be the one to put yourself forward. And, and that whole, you know, you use the, the interviewing as the example, it's a two-way street. Absolutely. <laughs> it's not just a, you know, they're reading your resume. No, stand out. This is your time to shine and, and really show them the type of person you are. Love, love, love that. And lo- I can't wait to dig into more of your book. Like that is like so exciting. Um, one thing I think would, might be really helpful if you're game is let's do an example. Like you were talking about pulling somebody out of the audience, right? Like let's, let's just play a little bit and, and see what that feels like, because I think that's a really important, um, exercise just to share with people, right? Because we get in our own heads Mm -hmm. and tell ourselves those crazy stories. (laughs) Are you game? Because you're the person I'm going to have to do a transformation. Of course, of course. I'm okay. totally game. Now, I'm also going to say to people, because uh, every time I do this, everybody is, oh, goes, oh my God, if I can just get Joanna to create my jazzy language for me, all of the magic will happen for me. It helps for sure. Uh, trans- like fantastical career transformations happen when the person learns how to confidently sell their future value. And I'm gonna give you some, I have a client who was basically awesome when I met her, who when we met, uh, she would confidently ask for about $350,000 a year in compensation. So no slouch by any stretch of the imagination. Um, She just went through, she's had I've been with her for a year. She just went through a recent process because by the way, you date a job, you do not marry it. Um, Because she is about to start her (laughs) next adventure. Um, She, in the very first meeting with a recruiter, when they said like, what are your salary expectations? um, Said a million dollars total all in. I'm like, no, can I promise you everybody that you're going to go from 350 to a million? No, but that's, the the she has absolutely learned how to sell her potential in a way that is genuine and authentic and real and it's not just about the jazzy language although she totally does have some jazzy language i'm just gonna say okay so enough about that back to you okay well so we have to benchmark first um if we haven't been having this conversation and you had just met me we were having a nice cocktail i'd come up to canada to visit um which we could totally make happen um And I said, oh, it's so lovely to meet you. Um, What do you do? Because that is the question we all ask. Mm -hmm. How do you answer that question today? I would say, well, Joanna, I work with individuals to become much more conscious leaders in the world. And leaders as in helping them to, you know, really step into their full power, have a bold voice and, you know, be at their potential. Okay. 
Awesome. That's what you would say? That's pretty much okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> for the listeners, because this is for them as much as it is for you. Of for course. the listeners, I want you to think about what story you are saying about Vicky now. Like, are you clear about how you would like, so say for instance, you ran into one of your friends and they were like, oh, you know, I'm struggling or I'm stuck in my career. Um, would you then be able to say that back to that person? Like, would you be able to say, um, well, are, you know, do you, are you looking for having a bold voice? Are you looking to be a conscious leader? Are you looking like, would you be able to say that? Because one of the key things, especially on introductions is what do you want them to recognize? And what do you want them to remember? Because again, every decision is made about you in a room, room that you're not in. Um, now I know I totally put you on the spot because that's a really, that's like it. everybody struggles with the first version. Um, I have some questions for you that will help me craft something a little tighter. Why conscious leader and why bold voice? Mm. Is that what you want to be wanted for? Yes. And why? Yep. Um, I'll, I'll do the abbreviated version. I spent 30 years in corporate career and stress took a toll on me physically. Um, and so I conscious leadership is about helping people learn to respond versus react. So significant, significantly reducing stress in our life. So that's one. I'm, I'm doing the Reader's Digest version. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. And bold voice is very much, um, you know, through my career leading multiple organizations, I always, in particularly women, struggle to have their voices heard. And so for me, it's about how do I help you amplify that voice so that you can be in that full confidence? Um, and so that's important to me because I would hear women say, well, I don't get the opportunities or you know, men speak over me in meetings or whatever. And so really helping them be bold in that voice. Okay. Um, and what does fantastical success look like for you? Uh, what are you ambitious for? What am I ambitious for? Yep. More women leaders, <laughs> more balance in the world. Uh, balance is not the right word, more harmony in the world so that we have a good mixture of that femininity and that masculinity. Um, that's what would be hugely successful, successful. <laughs> and making, you know, a million dollars a year would be really fantastic as well. <laughs> Let's just be honest. <laughs> I am not going to ding that one anywhere. <laughs> And yes, I talk about price and all of this constructs as well, because I think it's important, right? Sure it is. Um, oh, I could go down so many paths, paths with this, um, but I'm going to give you another way to introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, so as here's a, this is me being you for a second. Um, for the women in the workplace who want to have outsized impact, I think there are two major issues that they need to recognize and react to. One, that creating a bold new future is going to drain all your energy. Mm. And so moving forward in a way that is actually self-care as opposed to energy draining is a strategy that will allow you to make your dreams come true. And second, that ambitions are never manifested alone. And so they need to hear you as a much as see you. So if you can approach your career with a focus of self-care and a focus, focus around people hearing you, you can actually make all of your dreams, however big they are, come true. And I'm here to help people implement the strategies and the steps to make that happen. Wow. <laughs> Joanna. <laughs> Bravo. So, here's the, what if we were in front of an audience and here's, what, an here's, audience. here's what we are kind of, but here's what I, Virtually. Would, here's what, here's my shout out to the listeners is what I want you to send back to Vicki when she posts this is what did you hear? The answer to what did you hear? And the answer to what did you remember? Love it. Right. Because when you ask somebody and here's a here's a pro tip for anybody, when you are introducing yourself, um, I am a big fan 
of when you've made the introduction, you've gone, hello, hello, hello. And you've done all the things you can say, hey, I just I am practicing a new way of introducing myself, which, by the way, is the feminine get out of jail free card for this doesn't make me sound like a braggadocious asshole because we have a different rule book as women. Um, you say to them, I'm practicing introducing because some crazy lady told me I had to. Again, I'm now pushing it out to the third party, also a power move. And you say, what did you just hear? Mm. And the reason that question is important is two things are going to happen. One, you are going to get immediate feedback into did your story land the way you wanted it to? Because what I'm going to want somebody to like this whole self-care, can they hear you thing is actually the problem that you're solving. I love the balance of those two things, by the way. Thank you. What did they hear? Um, The other thing it does is you come back to what I talk about, which is the every decision made about you and your opportunities as a maid in a room that you're not in. It means your room needs to know how to talk about you the way you want to do. And by asking them, what do they hear? They just had a practice session. Now, bonus points, if it's somebody you really know, you then go, hey, can I get your phone number? Because I want to text you a question in like, I don't know, 72 hours. 70, 48 to 72 hours later, you send them a text message and you say, hey, do you remember that thing I did the other day? You give them no context. What do you remember? Mm. And what comes back is what people want you for. Because they are going to remember the thing that they cared about, not the thing about who you are. And you heard me say it very carefully as I was interviewing you. The question, if you have, uh, and I say ambitions in the gentlest way, because what looked like ambitions for me will not look like ambitions for somebody else everybody's ambitions are unique. And so like, and an ambition is whatever you want for the future um, to make your dreams come true. And I come back to Cinderella, her dream, her happily ever after was to be able to spread goodness and kindness at scale. And oh, good God, I can't think of a better job than being the queen of future queen of fairytale land in actually being able to do that at scale. Like she had a really small operation when she was part of Family Tremaine, really big operation as now the queen of fairy tale land. Well done, ambitions and dreams come true. But that whole, what is it you want to be wanted for? And understanding in your heart what that is, is really important. And, you know, and I, I'll say this for women, we innately seem to understand the answer to that question when it comes to our children. Mm, right so true. <laughs> I talk to people who make people and I say this is for dads as well uh while it is probably the hardest question you ever ask for yourself who you want to be for your children is such a question you ask for yourself and I sit here and I say your children are just and not in the terrible way. They are just family Tremaine. And so when you think about ambitions, when you sit here and go, if I want to be the queen of fairy tale land, like what is that for everybody else? Because we are all just like your kids trying to help us see each other's potential. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant, Joanna. Brilliant. <laughs> wow. That was terrific. And I know I put you on the spot a little bit there. Oh, it's all good. Out. But I I just really felt like, you know what, for our audience to be able to walk away today with like something so powerful and see the difference in, you know, just how you introduce yourself and how to get that feedback without it coming across, you know, in a, in a negative way or an ego way. That was terrific. Thank you so, so much. You, you've shared so much and and I'm cognizant of our time. (laughs) We went a little bit over today, which is terrific. It was well worth it. And I know we're going to get lots of feedback from, from our listeners on, you know, what their takeaways were from today. So please do, you know, share with us what you're taking away. And Joanna, how can, okay, we know that your book is on Amazon. Yep. Right. And so how can our audience also interact with you if, you know, they want to follow you on social media, where, where will they find you? I am the, the benefits of having a very unique name. Um, is you can find me everywhere. If I'm at Joanna Bloor on 
uh, Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter. You can also go to the talesofpotential.com website and, and find information there. I will say I'm probably most active on LinkedIn mm. um, because obviously I am talking, living, breathing, and eating the professional world. Well, that sounds kind of creepy, but that's it's, it's <laughs> essence what I do. So if you wanna if you wanna uh, engage me, that's the best place to do so. Although pro tip there because. Oh, good googly moogly. This is the thing that absolutely makes me crazy. If you connect with somebody on LinkedIn, always, and yes, it's an extra step, always add a personal note. Because if you are just hitting the connect button and sending nothing, it's like the physical equivalent of somebody running up to you to a conference, shoving their business card in your hand and then running away. Mm, and I go, point. oh my God, what a missed opportunity. Uh, and I'll tell you, if for the people who, if they connect with me and send me a personal note, like I will respond to all of those. And like digital relationships are just as important as in real life relationships. And like, so start it off on the right foot by adding a little of yourself in there. And no, you don't have to put a big, like, here's who I am and what I'm all about. Just say, like, I heard you on Vicky's show and yeah. I want to or reference, reference her book, Tales of Potential, Absolutely. the Cinderella story Absolutely. you haven't heard. <laughs> awesome. Joanna, thank you. Oh my gosh, this has been amazing. And thank you so much for being such a great guest on our show and uh, showing up so fully today. I know our audience is going to have great feedback. So we're excited to hear that. And I want to make sure, you know, I take a moment here and thank our audience, um, you know, let us know what you thought of the show. We'd love to hear, like, how has this impacted you? Did you like the live demo? Um, I think that was that was just terrific. And in, in seeing how you can enhance your message and yourself when it comes to showing your potential. So, Joanna, thank you again. Audience, thank you. We look forward to seeing you on our next show. And Joanna, let's let's make a date. You have to come back and do this again with us. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Take care, everyone.